looking at my shelf of Zatch Bell manga, and right now this video is volume 12 and 13, and after that comes 14, and after that comes 15. Hi, hello, my name is Ash, welcome to Pages in the Stars. If you're new here, hello. If you're returning, welcome back. And if you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below so you can be alerted to all my bookish, not bookish, and sometimes ranty content. Welcome back to my Zatch Bell breakdown and review series. Today, as I said before, we're covering volumes 12 and 13. The two things I wanna do before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video. First thing, this is my water bottle, but let's look a little bit closer at my water bottle. It's a little kiddo keychain on it. I love him. He matches my water bottle. The second thing I wanted to do is give, basically give a special shout out and thanks to the members of the Zatch Bell fandom and community who've been helping me with these videos. Whether it's cross-referencing the anime and the manga, trying to fact check something, trying to research something in the series. It's me in the video, but I've had a lot of backup and help and support with making these videos. So thank you so much for those of you who've been helping me, the research aspect of it. You know who you are. Thank you so much. I appreciate the heck out of you. So we start off volume 12 with Z with Zatch and Kiyu basically just shooting the breeze. They're having a great day at the park. Zatch is playing around, probably playing a little bit too rough for Kiyo's liking. They have a picnic, they're talking, they're doing again very normal things that look like fun and relaxing. Zatch even talks about how much fun he's having and how happy he is that Kyo has time to play with him. And Zatch says, you know, I hope these happy times can last forever. Me too, Zatch. Me too. Anyway, all of this is interrupted by Penny. Penny has returned, except this time she's more angry, she's more vengeful, but she's not even alone. This time she has three ancient Momoto with her that she was basically gifted by Milordo Z to try to go take out the competition. I will say one thing, this battle does take a while and to me it felt really exposition heavy, but it needed to be exposition heavy because there are a couple of questions that need to be answered. A, when we when we see these, these ancient Momoto fight, they are incredibly strong, but they're also incredibly angry. So it's like, okay, why are these ancient Momoto so angry? But we also have to answer the question, these Momoto are from the battle of 1,000 years ago. So their human partners are long gone. How do they have human partners to read their spells and, and fight with them? There are a couple of questions that need to be answered in this battle, and the only person who can really answer them is Penny. So we get a lot of exposition from Penny. And one of the first things Penny explains during this fight is that these Momoto are so angry and so vengeful because they've been in stone for 1,000 years. They weren't able to return to the Momoto world and go home, and they also weren't able to finish their battle. So they're incredibly angry. They want some, they want to fight, they want to finish this battle, but there's also a lot of pain and anguish in there over not being able to return home and being stuck in stone for 1,000 years. Penny also mentioned something about Milordo Z freeing them from the stone tablets, which also, you know, light bulb moment for Keo. He realizes that the stone tablets that Penny is talking about are the same stone tablets that he and his father found. For a while, Zach and Keo are able to somewhat keep up with the ancient Momoto. They're kind of able to evade some of their attacks and use a lot of their lower level spells to fight. But as Penny points out, she kind of notices that Zatch and Kiyo are using their lower level spells to try to conserve energy. But she says that's not going to work with these Momoto because again, their power is being partly fueled by their anger and they haven't even unleashed their strongest spells yet. And then Penny enlightens Zatch and Kiyo and also us as to how these um, as to how these Moto have human partners. This is where Kiyo notices that the human partners that are with these ancient Momoto don't seem to have emotions. They're not really reacting to the battle. They're not talking. They're not showing any. They're not showing any emotions at all. So Kiyo questions this. Okay, you know what's going on with these humans? And Penny explains that because these Momoto are from the battle of 1,000 years ago, Milordo Z's strategy was to track down the descendants of these Momoto's human partners from 1,000 years ago. So track down these descendants, kidnap them, and basically do experiments, tests to see if they were able to read the book. But those were very few and far between. 
So what Mi Lordo Z did was he manipulated the heart and the mind energy of each of these human beings in order to match it to the same wavelength of the book. And on top of that, he also removed any emotions that he felt weren't going to be necessary for fighting. So he removed like, happiness, joy, all that good stuff, and basically just left rage and anger to fuel these human beings strength from within when they fight. This rightfully so infuriates Zatch and Keo. Like, how can this, how can this Milordo Z go around using his power to just manipulate the hearts and the minds of people like that? It infuriates them because they're just genuinely horrified of the idea of people being manipulated into fighting like this, but but it also hits them on a personal level because remember Kalulu and how she was forced into fighting when she didn't want to when she didn't want to fight and she was given this whole other personality that made her fight this isn't all that different so aside from you know the surface level of you know just being horrified that people are being manipulated into fighting Zach and Kiyo know what this looks like firsthand this is able to push and spur them on a little further they're able to stand up but Kyo still doesn't have any strength from within left. He's not necessarily down for the count, but he's not in any position to fight whatsoever. But just as they're about to be attacked by a trifecta of spells from the ancient Momoto, who show up? Tia and Megumi with a shield to save the day. I remember when I watched this in the anime, I was so excited. Tia and Megumi just came in with a Sayoshi, and it's just like, they're saved. Oh my God, I was so excited. I was so excited and I felt a lot of that same excitement in reading and rereading this in the manga. So how did Tia and Megumi know to come and help Zatch and Kyo? Remember Dr. Riddles and Kiddo from last volume? Well, in the same way that Dr. Riddles and Kiddo had a battle with Zatch that was basically just for training purposes and Zatch gained a new spell out of that battle, they did the same with Tia and Megumi and Tia gained two new spells out of it. Dr. Riddles basically called up Megumi and said, hey, um, you know Zatch and Kyo, go save them. <laughs> that's basically that's basically what happened. At the end of volume 11, Dr. Riddles had said something along the lines of, evil ones are slowly growing their numbers and I'm going to need all the help I can get to fight them. He wasn't kidding and he's following through on it. You can see he's like slowly, you know, putting together people who are going to be able to help him when the evil ones finally do show themselves. And I wonder who the evil ones could be. It couldn't be this Momoto, Milordo Z, who's, you know, wreaking havoc and manipulating humans and freeing thousand year old Momoto from stone tablets, could it be? So anyway, Tia's got two new spells. They're both really cool. One of them is the spell called Syphogio. It's a healing spell, except the problem is it looks like an attack spell. It's this giant sword. So when Megumi reads the spell Syphogio and Tia hurls it at Kyo, it's kind of funny because Zatch thinks Tia's trying to attack Kyo when she's actually just trying to heal him. So with his new strength, Kyo is able to devise a plan that is going to help them take down the thousand year old Momoto because now he has a strength he has some strength left you know maybe for one or two more spells and what I like about a lot of the battles coming up with these ancient Momoto is they're not just focused on the strength of the Momoto there's a lot of innovation that comes with these battles because our heroes have to work together and combine their powers to make them work to defeat these ancient Momotos these battles are no longer just based on brute strength unless you're someone like Brago, these battles now have a lot more innovation and creativity going into them because they have to do a lot more in, in order to take down these much stronger opponents. So Tia's second new spell is another shield, but it's not a shield that protects her or her friends. It's a shield that goes around the enemy. And this way when the enemy reads their spells, it bounces off Tia's shield right back at them. She puts the shield around the ancient Momoto, which blocks them from being able to read their spells. And blocking the ancient Momoto from using their spells, Tia gives Zatch and Kyo the perfect opportunity to strike with the final bell of Zakarika. Once the books of the ancient Momoto are burned, the humans, the humans come back to themselves. They're essentially freed from whatever spell they were under. And this is a moment where you really kind of get to see <laughs> how this battle is once again impacting the human world. Gumi and Kyo go up to the humans and talk to them, try and find out if they know what happened to them, how they got where they are, you know, do they remember anything? And one of the guys says, I have no memory of what happened to me. And then looks at Kyo and Megumi and sees, their, sees them all battered and bruised and says, what happened to you? Who did this horrible thing? So not only do they have no memory of how they got under the control of Milordo Z, 
but they have no memory of the battles or what just happened. And then we get to the broken, we get to the broken butterfly pin. This gentleman says, oh my goodness, it was my daughter's birthday, like I left work to get her a birthday present, and he pulls this box out from, he pulls this box out from the pocket in his coat and opens the box and it's this butterfly pin, and it's broken. His daughter's birthday present is broken. This is another one of those opportunities where we see how the Momoto battle is impacting the human world beyond a property damage or, you know, we have to save these people from the destruction of the battle. These people are directly being impacted by the Momoto battle. There are still people out there who are under the control of Milordo Z. We know this because in volume 11, we saw the size of his, of his ancient Momoto army. So we know there's still other humans out there who need to be freed from his, from Milordo Z's control. One of the things that I had some people helping me with over the weekend was trying to figure out exactly how long these people have been under, under Milordo Z's mind control, mental manipulation, Manipulation. I, we kind of narrowed it down and figured it couldn't have been any more than five to seven days, assuming that all the human partners were found after Milordo Z freed the Momo, freed the ancient Momoto from their stone tablets, which was shortly after uh, Zatch's battle with Penny. We have a Momoto out there who's not only messing with the Momoto world and the future of the Momoto world, but is also deeply interfering in the human world as well. This is not the first time we're going to see that in this series. And here is where things get even more interesting. So we check back in with Brago and Sherry, who are also battling an ancient Momoto. And once they vanquish the ancient Momoto, Sherry goes up to the human, same as Zatch and Keo, and starts talking them to them, trying to figure things out. Brago and Sherry realize that the humans were under some type of mind control or mental manipulation. And Sherry says, I guess, that she found out from one uh, from the human partner that the person doing all of this was named Milordo Z. Brago tells Sherry that there is no one named Milordo Z in this battle, that there is only one Momoto capable of manipulating the hearts and the minds of others like that. Only one Momoto contains this power. Just like the Momoto who manipulated the heart of Sherry's close friend, Coco. Zophis! That's right, everyone. This absolute sad sack of molded trash is back. Gotta hate Zophis so much. So again, have to applaud Raikou for the setup here because the first time we saw this whole thing with Sherry and Coco and, you know, Sherry losing Coco and Coco's mind being manipulated by a Momoto was back in volume six. We're in volume 12 and now things are really starting to unfold and pick up the pace. So there was a lot of setup that was done that again, it, if you stick with the series, it takes time, but you get there. This also completely, completely raises the stakes in the series. So you have Zatch and company who are obviously going to be committed to fighting Zophis, but then you also have Sherry and Brago who are also going to be committed to fighting Zophis, both for two different reasons. Zatch and Kyo and Tia and Mugumi are ultimately going to be fighting Zophis because it's the right thing to do. Sherry on the other hand is fighting Zophis because she wants, she is fighting Zophis for something completely personal. She wants to free Coco. She wants her friend back. And she's going to do anything in order to get Coco back. The next few pages actually show Zophis taking off his mask because now that Cherry and Brago have figured out his true identity, he doesn't need his mask anymore. We also see Coco too, and she looks quite different from how we saw her with Sherry in volume six. She's got fancy clothes, her hair's a little bit different. This is clearly not the Coco that Sherry knew when they were as childhood friends. Banter back and forth for a little bit and Zophis says that, you know, he wore the mask to hide his identity in the hopes that no one would figure out what he was doing. He was fortunate because in this time, not only was he able to collect the, the tablets of the ancient Momoto, but in those ancient Momoto, he was able to collect the tablets of the four most powerful ancient Momoto. And then he goes on to say that he can't wait to see all the Momoto suffer at the hand of his army. So then we check back in with Zatch, Tia, and Kyo, who are working tireless, tirelessly to find out where Milordo Z's hiding spot is. Kyo was able to get this little tiny clue, a little tile that has this unknown language on it from one of the humans that was being manipulated by Milordo Z. And Kyo is hoping that if he's able to figure out what language is on this tile, then he will be able to trace it back to where Milordo 
Shadow Z is hiding. Keep in mind that at this point, Sherry and Brago are the only ones who know the true identity of Milordo Z and know that he is Zophis. The others do not figure that out for another couple of volumes. Tia asks Zatch where Ponygon is. Zatch tells her that Ponygon has gone out, has gone out to find his book owner because keep in mind, it is easy to forget that Ponygon is a Momoto because he is so pet and you know dog-like, but Ponygon is a Momoto and he does not have his book owner yet. So Ponygon has been out trying to find his book owner, but just as Tia asks Zatch about him, Ponygon waltzes in and we clearly see him without his book. So that raises some questions. Just as Ponygon walks in, Kyo jumps up with excitement exclaiming that he's found where the tile is from after three days of research and absolutely zero sleep. It's at this point that Ponygon gives Kyo a letter and it is from none other than Dr. Riddles. And Dr. Riddles, uh, knows how hard Kyo has been working to find the secret hideout of Me Lordo Z and has been doing so without sleep. <laughs> And meanwhile, while Keo's been doing this, Dr. Riddles apparently found out, found where Milordo Z was hiding a week ago. It's at this point that Keo is frustrated because Dr. Riddles is making a mockery of him in this letter and tries to tear up the letter, but comes to his senses and decides not to do it. In the letter, Dr. Riddles lets Keo know that Milordo Z is hiding in a mountainous region in a ruin in, in South America. He has made travel arrangements and everything for not just Keo and Zatch and Ponygon, but also for Tia and Megumi as well to travel there. He warns in his letter to try not to get into f individual fights with the ancient Momoto, that they are going to be too strong to take down, and that it is better that they work together as a team. Dr. Riddles also says that he and Kiddo are traveling to try and find the more allies who are going to fight with them to try to take down the Lord Z. Dr. Riddles also reminds Kiyo that, you know, when you're going through a tough, tough time, when your feet, when you feel like you're not going to be able to accomplish, to accomplish your goal, to remember that there are others who feel like you and that you are not alone. As Joki and comedic as Dr. Riddles can be, he genuinely does have the best interest of the Momoto world at heart and wants what is best for the Momoto world. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is in a couple of videos. And not only is he going out of his way to travel and find allies, but he's also arranging the travel arrangements for them just to put together a team that is going to be capable of taking down Milordo Z. Anyway, so we're off to the ruins. Once they arrive there, they hear a rustling in the forest and Zatch, Kyo, Tia, Megumi are immediately on the defense and ready to attack, but it's Kanchime and Fulgore. <laughs> That's right, Kanchime and Fulgore are back. Dr. Riddles also recruited the two of them to come help fight and take down Milordo Z. And while Kyo and Zach are like, cool, the more help the better, Tia is not so pleased. You see, Tia and Kanchime have a bit of a history in the Momoto world. And what I mean by a history in the Momoto world, I mean that Tia used to bully Kanchime and call him a crybaby all the time when they were in the Momoto world. So Tia is not so sure that Kanchime is going to be of any help to them whatsoever. Kanchime talks a little bit about his encounter with Dr. Riddles and Kiddo when he was in the North Pole, because remember, he accidentally got on a research ship to the North Pole in volume 10. So he explains more about his encounter with Kiddo and Dr. Riddles in the North Pole when they encountered their own thousand-year-old Momoto. And Dr. Riddles tried to explain to Kanchime what exactly was going on, and Kanchime tried to peace out because he didn't want any part of it because he didn't think he was going to be valuable in fighting against them. He didn't really think that he had a purpose or he was going to be useful. But Dr. Riddles told him the exact opposite, that not only was Kanchime going to be useful in the battle against these thousand year old Momoto, but his power was also going to be incredibly needed. The way Dr. Riddles first interacts with Kanchime and Fulgore is very different than the way that he first interacted with Zatch and Kyo, but also Tia and Megumi. There is no battle with Kanchime and Fulgore for the purpose of trying to train them to make them stronger. I genuinely think that Dr. Riddles knew that that was not going to work with Kanchime. Kanchime is not someone who's going to grow from that kind of experience, at least in my opinion. While it may have worked for Zatch, Kyo, and Tia, and Megumi, this was not going to work with Kanchime and Fulgore. So Dr. Riddles simply gets down on Kanchime's level and tells him how useful and how desperately needed he is going to be in this battle. And the teacher world, we call this differentiation. When the objective is the same for the students, but the way in which you reach them and the way in which you get to that objective is different. 
with that in mind, our heroes enter the ruin, greeted by Gyarados and Pennywise's long lost child. I mean, Almond Gelios. I really gotta stop with these ridiculous nicknames for some of these Momoto. So Keo has a plan in mind that is absolutely going to utilize, Con that is absolutely going to utilize Konchime to his full potential. And Konchime and Fulgore are absolutely terrified. Konchime's power, his ability to transform and project illusions is incredibly powerful and incredibly useful. The issue at this point, at this stage in the battle with Konchime and Fulgore is A, Konchime still lacks that confidence sometimes, and B, Fulgore does not necessarily have the innovation or know the best way in which to utilize Konchime's power. Oftentimes what ends up happening is that someone has to devise a plan and tell them what they need to do in order to be success in order to be successful and what Kanchime needs to do in order to make the battle work. This is not the first time you are going to hear me bring this up, but believe me, we are going to get there. So Kyo first instructs Kanchime to turn into a wheel so Fulgore can kind of hamster run him down a set of steps and lure the enemy away. Then he tells Kanchime that he needs to transform into a grappling hook so they can get over, like, over this wall, over this wall, and into the next corridor. And then once they're in that corridor, Kyo tells Kanchime that he needs to transform into a fake wall so the so the ancient Momoto think they have Fogori Fogori and Kanchime pinned. And then once they get close enough, Kanchime needs to transform back into himself so that the enemy will fall into this cornered off room. So it really is a brilliant strategy and really does showcase how versatile Kanchime's power can be. It's just, again, a lot of times Kanchime and Fogori, at this, again, at this stage in the game, need to be told what to do with Kanchime's power. So this leaves Zatch, Tia, Kyo, and Megumi fighting uh, fighting Alm and Gelios, and Kanchime in that corridor with Fulgore and Pony and book ownerless Ponygon uh, about to face off with this Momoto named Gans Gans. The battle with Zatch and company and Alm and Gelios starts, and Zatch kind of starts pleading with him, telling them, you know, you don't have to fight for me Lord OZ anymore. You don't have to keep doing his bidding and doing his dirty work. And the Momoto kind of laughs it off and says, you know what? It, no, I'm happy, you know, he's given us this opportunity to do what we're doing. That, you know, Al Alm says that he is grateful for what me Lord OZ has done, you know, freeing him from those, freeing him from that stone after those thousand, after that thousand years. This causes Zatch to change his game plan a little bit because he starts to think, if I were trapped in stone for 1,000 years, I'd probably be just as angry and vengeful and eager to fight as they are. So Zatch doesn't necessarily want to fight them in the way that we've seen Momoto battles traditionally go down. And this is where we wrap up volume 12 and we're gonna jump in to volume 13, which is a little bit of a doozy. And I don't mean that in a bad way. We just get introduced to a very interesting character and a couple of fan favorites in volume 13. So let's roll with it. Zatch's strategy for the battle with Alm and Gelios isn't to attack them directly. He doesn't want them to suffer any more than they already have. So what Zatch intends to do is to focus on the humans with the books and try to get the books away from them so, the, so he doesn't have to directly attack the Momoto and cause more suffering to them. Throughout this battle, Zatch continues to say, you know, you don't have to fight this battle. You're battle ended 1,000 years ago, you don't have to continue fighting. And throughout this battle, while Am and Gelios are pretty focused on Zatch, they don't focus so much on Tia and Megumi, who've been storing up a lot of their strength. And Tia is able, and Megumi is able to use Tia's strongest shield, which at this point is Masa's shield, to protect us, to protect Kiyu and Zatch from a really strong attack, which allows Megumi to get the books from the humans and burn the books. While Alm's book is burning, we do learn a little bit more. We learn that Milordo Z's power manipulation works in, a works in a certain way where it's not just in the humans impacted, but the Momoto are also impacted in a way where the ancient Momoto are unable to burn each other's books. So let's say if for some reason, a couple of Momoto, a couple of ancient Momoto decided, hey, um, I don't wanna do this, this isn't right, 
they couldn't, you know, let's say burn each other's books to go back to the Momoto world because they are blocked from attacking each other. If they try to attack each other, the human, the, the spell the human tries to read ultimately fails. Alm also says that if they were somehow able to, Milordozi's power works in a way where if they, they disobey him to that degree, they would be turned back to stone. He also says that there's some special type of moonlight stone that helps them recover and rejuvenate their power really quickly and heals them when they need it, which is why they keep having to come back to the castle. He also lets Thatch know that there are even stronger Momoto to come in the castle, and if he keeps trying this indirect fighting strategy, it's not gonna work and he's, 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 not, he's not going to be able to keep up this strategy. Teams regroup, so we have Zatch, Tia, and Kanchime, who was successful in he, who was successful in his battle with Gan. He was able to shrink down to a really small size, sneak up to the human, and burn the book with a match. That was a great way to use Kanchime's power. Kanchime uses that strategy a lot in the series. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But in this case, it worked in favor for our little dude Kanchime. And Kanchime being Kanchime even says to the Momoto Gans that, you know, when all this is over, when we're back Back in the Momoto world, if we see each other, we should be friends. Kanchime's a sweet dude, and he's definitely grown on me a little bit. Check back with me in two volumes to see if I still feel the same way though. So after this, our heroes get to have a nice rest and recuperate, right? Not quite, because now I have the pleasure of introducing you to Victorim, the gorgeous Sir Victorim. Possibly the biggest meme to come out of this series. <laughs> okay, so Victorim is this V-shaped Momoto who just thinks really highly of himself. And when he approaches the group, he's angered at first simply because they're not paying attention to him. There's also these bonus panel panels at the end of volume 13, which do appear in the anime, where he sings a song about how a melon has stolen his heart. Absolute meme material here. But even as much of a meme as Victorim is, they still have to fight him. Which is proving to be a little difficult because everyone's really low on strength from within and heart power and everyone is just tired. So this is one of those battles that's going to require a lot more creative innovation in order to be successful. Tia is able to use Syphogio, but instead of using it on Kyo, she uses it on Fulgore. And the combination of Kanchime turning himself into various things like one of Zatch's spells and Victorim's book was enough to throw Victorim off of his game completely. And they were able to grab his book and burn it. So another ancient Momoto down. At this point, everyone is wiped out. Literally no one has any more strength from within and no one is capable of fighting at this point. It's 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 it, it's useless. And also Ponygon, start, Ponygon starts behaving really weirdly. He kind of starts meru meru, he's doing his meru meru me, meru meru meruing. And of course, because this is Zatch Bell and nothing ever ends and the battles just keep coming and coming and coming and coming, they're approached by two more adversaries. It, it, it literally never ends at the series. Remember when I said that yes, there's a lot of setup and it feels like it moves slowly, but once it picks up, it literally moves at breakneck pace. Well, here you go. Enter Dalmos, this giant, Thing. I don't even know what he is. He just this is Dalmos and Layla, a character so beloved and adored that I even named a character in my current work in progress after her. Layla has this wand that has the detach that has this detachable moon that she uses as a weapon and is her main source for her spells. It's probably one of my favorite in the series just because it's so cool. It literally looks like one of the little wand lights that you would have when you were a kid, but it's just like ten times cooler. It's a detachable moon and you can fling it around and it just it's awesome. And Layla's first order of business is to use her detachable moon to create an opening in the wall for our heroes to get away. That's right, Layla's turn coding. She tries to use her spells to attack Dalmos, but she discovers that it's true, the thousand year old Momoto can't use their spells against each other, but that doesn't stop her from being able to use a defense spell when Dalmos tries to attack all of them, giving our heroes time to get away. Kyo questions what Layla is doing and why she's helping them, and Layla says she knows what she's doing is wrong. She knows that working for me Lord OZ is wrong and she's not going to do it anymore. So what ends up happening is that Kyo says, Zatch and I are going to stay with Layla. We're going to stay and help her fight Dalmos, but Kyo tells Kanchime, Fulgore, Tia, and Megumi to go escape, get rest. Kyo actually gives Tia 
Zatch's book because if Tia is guarding Zatch's book and holding on to it, then there's no way that Zatch can be sent to uh, can be sent back to the Momoto world. So Tia clings to that book for dear life and hightails it out of there. So that leaves Layla, her partner Albert, Zatch, Kyo fighting against Dalmos. I don't know what he is. What is he? 15 years later and I still don't know what this guy is. Layla keeps talking to her partner Albert, hoping that she'll be able to reach him, hoping that he'll be able to break free from uh, Milordo Z's curse. She sees the way Zatch and Kyo interact with each other and saw the way that Kanchimi and Fulgore and Tia and Megumi interacted with each other and wants her and Albert to become true partners like that. But unfortunately, he's just too deep in Milordo Z's curse that it, it's just not penetrating. He, he, she can't reach him. At this point, it's also worth pointing out that that Kyo also sent Ponygon away because one of the things that we talk about in this chapter, in this volume, is how Ponygon seems to have this really big aversion to fighting and doesn't even like seeing Zatch fight. So when when Ponygon, when he goes on these journeys to find his book owner and like stands out in the town square holding out his book for people to read, like he's we've seen him do in previous volumes, he'll hold out the book, but anytime there's an inkling that someone might have understood the book and been able to read it, Ponygon gets terrified. He is absolutely terrified of having to face his destiny and fight in this battle. But then when it comes to be that the human can't read the book, po, you just see this relief washing over Ponygon that, okay, you know, I another day, I don't have to worry about fighting in this battle. I don't, I, I don't have to fight. And we see it again that, you know, not all of these Momoto want to fight, or even if they do want to fight, there's a lot that they have to work through in order to, in order to fight. There's a lot that they have to do in order to face their destiny. And for Ponygon, he clearly has a lot to work through because the dude just doesn't want to fight. Back to Layla, Zatch, Kyo, and Albert. They try a few things to fight against Dalmos, but with Kyo not having Zatch's book and Layla really not being able to attack, attack Dalmos directly, it just doesn't work. And Dalmos is just too powerful. Layla straight up tries to sacrifice herself to Dalmos and says, I give up hoping that she'll be able to give Zatch and Kyo some time and some space to escape. But Damos, being the absolute personification of every after-school bully ever, says, ha, no, I'm gonna drag you all before my Lord OZ and watch you suffer. Just as Damos is about to grab Layla, we hear that Meru Meru Me in the background and in walks Ponygon, but not just Ponygon, in walks Ponygon with this gentleman holding a glowing book and it is Ponygon's glowing book. Ponygon has found his book owner. Everyone meet Kafka Sunbeam, German auto engineer and book owner to our boy Ponygon. This is such a triumphant moment in the series. It is so easy sometimes to forget that Ponygon is actually a Momoto and not a pet. You know, not a pet dog that looks like a horse. So to see him walk in with his book owner, especially knowing that, you know, we've come to this realization that Ponygon is terrified of fighting, seeing him walk in with his book owner, it's just... It's one of those moments where you have to just stand up and cheer and clap and you're just happy, <laughs> okay? Oh, but of course, who tracked down Mr. Sunbeam? Of course it was Dr. Riddles and Kiddo. And you know, we talk we talk a little bit more about Ponygon's fear to fight. So at first, when Sunbeam realized he could read Ponygon's book, Ponygon was scared. He was terrified. He was, you know, hiding under his hooves and shivering. We realized that now Ponygon could fight. He had that ability to participate in the battle that didn't exist before because he didn't have a book owner. And Sunbeam straight up tells Dr. Riddles, he's not, he basically, he's not ready. He doesn't want to do this and I'm not going to force him into it. And that's one thing I really love about Sunbeam is how not only he understands people, but how he understands Ponygon and how he's kind of just able to read that off of him from the get-go. Again, to bring up Kalulu, this is a choice Kalulu didn't have. She had to fight. She had that alternate personality that when her spells were read, forced her to fight. But Sunbeam's basically giving Ponygon the choice that Kalulu didn't have. He's not going to force he's not going to force Ponygon into this battle. So he basically tells Dr. Riddles and Kiddo, "I I'm sorry, I don't think this is going to work out." Dr. Riddles calls Sunbeam an enlightened being, someone who is able to sense and really truly understand the emotions of people and know what they're feeling. And Kiddo kind of chimes in with 
you know, oh yeah, he was really able to understand what, what Ponygon was feeling. And then asks Dr. Riddles to make him sea urchin sushi, which apparently is just pudding and soy sauce. I love that Raikou gives us the opportunity to see little glimpses like this of characters who may not necessarily be at the forefront and be on every page, but still gives us, gives us the opportunity to see glimpses of their relationships and how they interact with each other like this. Anyway, back to our boy Ponygon. Ponygon's spells are strengthening and armoring his spells. His first spell gives him this shiny silver armor and makes him super fast. We read more about Ponygon's, you know, internal battle, internal conflict, his strong desire to protect his friends and to help them in battle, but also his immense fear of fighting. And it's ultimately this that fuels him through the battle. Every time Domos knocks Ponygon down, he thinks about Kanchime, or he thinks about Tia, or he thinks about Zatch, and how they behaved in battle, and how he has to help him, and this just fuels him to get up and keep fighting, even to the point that he's able to crack some of Damos' reinforced armor. When they have a moment to breathe in the battle, Sunbeam finally introduces himself to Zatch and Kyo as Kafs Sunbeam and I'm Ponygon's book owner. Kyo and Zatch are really excited, but one thing that I love about Sunbeam is that he's just very honest. He straight up says, this is my destiny to help Ponygon fight in this battle, but I'm a working man and I kind of wish it wasn't, but I've seen Ponygon struggle and I'm not going to abandon him. So it's because of his bond with Sunbeam and because of his desire to help his friends that he's able to unlock his second spell so quickly and ultimately deliver the final blow to Dalmos. Without Ponygon coming in, Zatch, Keo, Layla, and Albert would have been toast. Without his help, without Ponygon realizing that I have to help my friends, I have to work through this fear, they would have been toast, they would have been goners. But Ponygon worked past that and was able to help his friends. And that's huge. Even though Ponygon is basically an animal, again, I mean, yes, he's a Momoto, but a lot of his behavior in the show resembles that of a pet dog. But we're still able to empathize and sympathize with him like that. And that's another thing I love about this series. The characters just reach you on so many different levels. That still hits me as a full-fledged adult, even though I'm much closer to Sunbeam's age at this point than I am to any of the Momoto in this battle. The series just keeps hitting you and hitting you on so many different levels. And I am so thoroughly enjoying rereading it and revisiting it, revisiting it with adult eyes because there's so many things that I'm picking up on that I just never thought of before. With a, that's groovy, because that's quite literally Sunbeam's phrase. He says, that's groovy a lot. Uh, they walk away with Dalmos' torched book in this final shot before you wrap up volume 13. I love this panel. I absolutely love it. This is a team that has not come to play, even though they literally just started fighting fighting together. They have such an incredibly strong bond, and I absolutely love it. Every moment hope feels like it's lost, our heroes figure out a clever way to gain the upper hand again, or a new or a new friend comes to help them along. So yeah, this is also where we really start to see how the power of friendship, how the power of friendship plays into the series as a theme because it runs really heavy in a lot of different and beautiful ways. That wraps up volume 13. In the span of two volumes, we have vanquished five ancient Momoto, but yeah, there are a lot more to come. I will see you all next time for the breakdown and review of volume 14. From this point forward, we are probably going to do single volume videos only because these volumes just keep getting more chock packed full of action and it's getting harder to break them down in groups. But I will see everyone in the next video where we break down volume 14. Give a like, give a subscribe if you feel so inclined and I will see all of your beautiful faces next video. Bye.